the Arctic. After months of winter, the sky begins to lighten. The sun peeks over the horizon, and the landscape blazes in a ruddy golden glow. It's the signal. Life reawakens after months of hibernation. The lord of the Arctic leaves his den. His fat stores enabled him to survive the long months of winter. But it's time to rebuild his energy stores. He rediscovers his vast territory encased in ice, frozen in time. The glaciers seem to slumber, and the sea hides under its thick cover, the sprawling ice shelf that has supported life for thousands of years. In these first days of spring, survival depends on knowing how to deal with the cold, the wind, and the snow. That's how it has always been for dwellers of the Arctic. Adaptability has allowed the Inuit to survive the rigors of the Arctic. Hunting provides not just food, but also their tools and their clothing. their age-old traditional culture is still very much a part of the way of life and the customs of this remarkable people. Ice has kept the area in isolation, but the conquest of the Arctic has, for centuries, lured many a daring navigator with dreams of finding the famous Northwest Passage, a sea route to link Europe and Asia. Sailing the Northwest Passage has remained a major challenge for explorers who, until very recently, risked their lives to sail across the Arctic. In 2002, the oceanographic schooner Sedna IV set off to conquer the legendary passage. At the time, the Arctic was still a land of ice, dangerous and hostile to navigation. Scientists were already sounding the alarm about accelerating climate change that was threatening some of the Arctic's iconic species who depend on the ice for survival. Predictions of calamity came by the dozens, but warnings for scientists were largely ignored. Scientists are increasingly worried about the consequences of climate change for Arctic wildlife. An expedition to observe the effects of global warming at the flow edge gets underway. So we are, uh, we're on the beach now. We're just about to go into the, the sea ice, the frozen ocean. Uh, we're going to be taking three mm -hmm. sleds, two people per sled, and we're going to head uh, due east across the frozen ocean out towards the flow edge. So it's the... David sleds. Reed knows the sea ice well. Every spring, he joins the Inuit of the village of Pont Inlet to document changes observed over recent decades. The mission leader of the schooner's Sedna IV, Jean Lemire, is also familiar with the Arctic. His many expeditions have documented the devastating effect of climate change all over the planet. He's joined by fellow explorer Gilles Gouet, a globetrotter who has been on over 65 expeditions in various parts of the globe. It'll take several hours for the expedition to reach the flow edge. The frozen ocean is a highway for snowmobiles towing hamutiks, the Inuit sled adapted for the ice and loaded with heavy equipment. The ice anywhere in the Arctic is important, but particularly, I think, for, for those that live here and depend on the land for food, sustainable uh, harvesting, hunting. Uh, 
If you can imagine um, the Trans Canada, you take it for granted that you can go on a highway and you can travel to visit friends and family. The ice is that to the Inuit. It, it's their means to travel, it's their means to hunt. It's an extension of the land for, for so much of the year. Yes, some travel is on terra firma, but what's unique about the Arctic is that for this chunk of the year, the, the water becomes land. Sea ice has always been crucial to Inuit culture. Nomadic families had no choice but to pack up their temporary camps to follow the seals, their main food source in winter. Today, the means of transportation may have changed, yet the ice maintains a vital role in the local culture that still uses the flow edge as a spring hunting ground. It's a serious playground. While you spend a lot of time on the ice and it feels solid under your feet, when you, when you visit somewhere like the floor edge and you sort of, you look over the edge and you realize that there's four feet, four or five feet of ice compared to the depth of the water, it's still only a membrane. It's a membrane of ice that we, we spend so much time traveling on. And again, it's that idea, if you take it for granted, that's when you get into trouble. You've always got to be aware of the fact that it's, it, it is impermanent. It, it can go, it can break up. Being able to live on this frozen ocean in the spring, far out to sea, is a privilege for these modern adventurers who, for 30 years, have been documenting changes caused by a climate in turmoil. Wow. That's nice. You can see the ice on the other side. It's the, the ice that used to be attached to the land facet that, we, that we're on has moved off. How many trips to the flow edge did you do? Since the beginning? Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 60? 60. 70? And you, Jill, when uh, did you come to the flow edge? The first time? I think the first time was in 1987. It was... In June, late June, it was still pretty good on the ice. And uh, we came back probably f between the 15 and the 17 of July. The ice was still strong enough to, to be able to walk and safely. I don't think it would be possible today to do that. No, and for the last few years, it's, it's rare that anybody's out here, at least on the, on the ice, past July the 1st. Yeah. Rising temperatures, observed in recent decades, have a direct effect on the ice shelf. Spring comes earlier every year, and fall comes later. This has a direct effect on the traditional activities of the Inuit. In the early 90s, it was always a bit of a challenge to go kayaking in, in early October, even late September. Uh, I remember clearly there the were occasions where the end of August, beginning of September, there was ice in the puddles. Um, and if I did, if I was able to go kayaking in early October, I would come back caked in ice and the paddle would be dripping with ice and there'd be icicles on the, on the kayak. Now I would say um, you can easily go kayaking well into October. 
Milder autumns delay the formation of the ice shelf. The spring thaw is also much earlier, which reduces the period of deep cold in the winter. Over the last 40 winters, the average thickness of the sea ice has been reduced by nearly a meter. So it's completely open, and this is this is the edge, and this is the area that attracts the, the most wildlife. But with the use of um, a hydrophone and an attached speaker, we can actually listen to what's going on un underneath the surface. Most of what you're hearing is uh, the bearded seal, known as the Ujuk, those long descending whistles, and also the long ascending whistles. I think a lot of people uh, that we talk to don't say, associate whistling with seals. Yeah. So when, when they hear it, they immediately ask, what is that? And then when you say, predominantly it's bearded seals that are very, uh, very vocal. It's interesting um, to watch sometimes the local hunters who are out here hunting seals. They, they know these animals so well. They eat them, they wear them, they, they hunt them year round. But in, in, in some cases, they've never ever heard them. So the relationship with this animal, it's a very intimate relationship. And occasionally when you, when you have the hydrophone in the water and they hear these animals that to an extent they know so well, but to see the expression on their face when they hear these sounds, it's like a whole other world. It's a whole other relationship opening up right in front of you. The one sound that's particularly uh, noticeable if it's in the area is a walrus. Um, again, you get a sense of the, what's above and what's below. So if, if you don't see any seals around, that's a possible indication that there's, um, that there's walrus around. And the sound that they make, it's almost like taking two pieces of wood and just tapping them together. polar bear is still hungry. He sets off hunting again, causing quite a disturbance. Everyone has to stay alert because the big predator is surprisingly stealthy despite his size. about a bear maybe seven, eight feet long. Yeah. But you can see just that print alone. It's probably the size of a dinner plate. Yeah. Probably a male. And one way you tell the difference between males and females is when, when bears walk, the males, their toes are slightly turned in. So you can see the difference between this print and this print. They're slightly turned in, whereas 
female tracks, not only is the track slightly smaller, but they tend to walk straighter. When you watch them walk, it's almost like they're in slow motion. And because the, the males have a lot of hair on the soles of their feet, which actually acts as a camouflage on the ice with the seals underneath, when they're walking, you can see how they, they drag and drop. They just drag and drop. So it's almost like they're sloping along. You can see where the hair has dragged before it's, it puts its foot down. They brush and step, brush and step. The sea ice is melting quickly again this year, exposing large expanses of open ocean. With Sedna in 2002, we were the seventh boat of the history to make the Northwest Passage in one season. And uh, we had a furious battle with ice, I mean, to mm -hmm. get through it. Now, I mean, if you go around Billot Strait in September, there's, you know, lots of boats that can do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, a couple of years ago, there was 28 either ships or yachts scheduled to make the passage. Yeah. yeah. In 2002, while attempting the Northwest Passage, Sedna 4 is blocked, stuck in shifting sheets of ice that endanger the big schooner. The crew, supported by a reconnaissance plane from the Canadian Ice Service, is at an impasse. These are precisely the conditions they wanted to avoid. The banging and grinding of the ice against the steel hull is unsettling. Finally, an opening. After hours searching for small leads, Sedna is able to break free of the ice. She becomes the seventh sailing ship in history to navigate the Northwest Passage in a single season without an icebreaker to assist. The big ship has returned to the same spot on the same date, 13 years later, to observe the effects of warming in the Arctic. The difference is overwhelming. Sea ice is just a memory in a number of parts of the Arctic in summer. And it's not just the sea ice that has been affected by warming. The glaciers have shrunk dramatically, and their rapid melting creates torrents of fresh water that pours into the sea. The bowheads are still here, but the ice which held their food in place and helped it to grow is gone. What are the long-term consequences for a species that has always depended on the ice? The snow has melted too. The great white mirror that reflected solar energy is gone, and the dark landscape now absorbs even more heat. Sedna can reach unexplored territories which were inaccessible in the past. Everywhere. Inshore and offshore, there isn't a trace of the ice shelf at the end of summer. Icebergs float in open water, transient vestiges of the great glaciers shrinking rapidly in this unaccustomed heat. Colossal slabs of ice remind us that the polar cap is also starting to break up far to the north in the high Arctic, where no one imagined global warming having an effect. 
They drift down here like monuments commemorating a very recent past. Other icebergs come directly from Greenland, another polar region affected by climate change. The accelerating disappearance of sea ice is opening the way for shipping. More and more ships are coming north for resource development or simply to visit this little known part of the world. But another worry has reared its head, natural resource extraction in the Arctic. The newly accessible region is a magnet for mining companies who would like to transport raw materials by sea. One of the world's largest deposits of iron ore has been found in a place called Mary River, which is about 100 kilometers south, southwest of uh, a pond, to provide the, the smelters with a, a consistent year-round supply of iron ore that would necessitate breaking the ice. At the moment, they're talking about utilizing the three, two and a half, three months of open water, which is obviously a lot easier to navigate, et cetera, et cetera. But in order to satisfy that demand, they want to push that to a 10-month shipping season. So does that impact the, the ability to travel on the ice? Yes, it does. There's no question about it. If all of a sudden there's a, let's say, a 100-foot wide lead in the ice, well, there's no way you can cross that. So the, the effect that the potential shipping has is that hunters will no longer be able to, to travel to and harvest in the areas that they traditionally did. The mine site is located near the narwhals' breeding grounds. Bad news for a species that uses sounds and vocalizations to maintain the social structure in groups. Narwhals th themselves tend to be quite a shy species. They're quite a skittish whale. Uh, and indications are that uh, they would initially leave the area if the shipping was allowed to proceed. Traditionally, hunters believed that animals would offer themselves to humans, provided they were treated with respect. Respect for their prey and the environment are at the root of Inuit traditions. Sharing traditional food, rich in fat and vitamins, has always been at the heart of these nomadic communities. Many generations of Inuit families have traversed the frozen wastes of the high Arctic to survive. This subsistence hunting provided food, clothing, and tools. Today, Subsistence hunting remains at the heart of modern Inuit communities. Not that long ago, this was the grocery store. So you can imagine what a celebratory feel it would be to, to get through that long, dark winter. And then not only the arrival of the warmer weather, but also the arrival of the animals, whether it be the polar bears, the, the seals, the whales, the snow geese. These animals, in many cases, are plentiful. In terms of the, the perception of, of people hunting animals, um, it has to be remembered that uh, if you were to catch a narwhal, to harvest a narwhal, that will feed several families for several days. The Flow Edge remains a spring gathering place for all the wildlife in the Arctic. Hunters and predators brave the elements to find their prey, following an age-old tradition now threatened by climate chaos. The great spectacle of Arctic life in the raw is here for all to see, but for how long?
while subsistence hunting is a major activity for Inuit communities, it is strictly regulated. Caps on the number of animals taken allow communities to continue a thousand-year-old tradition while protecting the herds. This bowhead whale, hunted off the village of Point Barrow, Alaska, will be cut up and shared with every member of the community, as tradition dictates. The South um, is the idea of, you know, humans and everything else. And I think the interconnectedness, the connection that exists still in this part of the world, that relationship that they have with the animals, it's a far deeper, more meaningful uh, relationship than I think we have in other parts of the world. At the flow edge, a narwhal has just been killed and hauled up on the ice. They are hunted primarily for their muktuk. The thick layer of skin and fat tastes like hazelnut and is a favorite delicacy among the Inuit. Scientists have determined that traditional Inuit hunting of narwhals for subsistence poses no danger to the conservation of the species. The Inuit deliberately leave the carcass and some of the meat on the ice, a way of sharing their catch with the animals they respect, like the polar bear. Narwhal. Mm-hmm. Caught by um, a local hunter. And they would have cleaned the, uh, the muktuk, the skin of the whale. They would have taken all that off. Um, they were probably headed back, back home to share it with the family and the, with the community. And the meat and the head will be left. And between the foxes and the polar bears, and you notice a lot of seagull tracks yeah, around. Yeah. So probably in a couple of days, it'll be picked completely clean. Yeah. Often the, the bears will take uh, the blubber first. Yeah. And then the meat. On average, one attack in every 20 will result in a kill for a bear. With the rapid shrinking of the ice shelf, polar bears are struggling to find enough food to survive. The smell of the carcass, a welcome offering from the hunters, gratefully accepted. And they have nothing to fear at this time of year. It's not bear hunting season, and the Inuit focus on other prey. Tonight, there's fresh meat on the menu for some, and muktuk for others. One creature's sacrifice help ensure the survival of others. It's midnight, another night as bright as day on this ice shelf that keeps on melting in the non-stop sunlight. The breakup was early again this year. In less than 40 days, it all disappeared. The sea ice is gone, and Sedna 4 can now explore areas that used to be hard to get to. Some bays that were completely ice covered are now open for exploration. The huge rise in mean temperature 
has transformed these northern vistas forever. The crew can see with their own eyes the dramatic retreat of the glaciers. In some areas, there's almost nothing left of these ancient glaciers. They vanished or are in rapid decline. The great spectacle of nature is increasingly threatened. Between Sedna IV's first trip to the Arctic less than 15 years ago and now, the changes to the landscape are striking. Images from that first expedition are records of another era. The Arctic is transforming rapidly, perhaps too rapidly. Many glaciers no longer reach the sea. The major retreat of the glaciers, long predicted by scientists, is real and visible today. Sedna IV was able to sail right to the end of a long arm of the sea. Until very recently, it was inaccessible because of ice. Streams of fresh water cut across the ancient moraine, eroding rock debris carried by the glacier tongue that used to dip into the bay. Not bad, huh? Fabulous. Fabulous. Starting at the top, you see all the runoff water that collects, because if you look here, it's all surface runoff. The runoff water under the glacier is what allows the glacier to advance. As you can see with the slope, the water runs faster and gets deeper. It must be just a trickle at the top. It's important to understand that in the Arctic, there is very little precipitation. And what forms a glacier is the accumulation of snow that's been tamped down. With hardly any precipitation in the Arctic, as it warms up, the balance will be thrown off. There won't be enough new snow to replace all the snow and ice that's melting. And that's why the glacier will slowly disappear like most of the glaciers here, because the temperature is already too high. Global warming projections give an average temperature rise for the old planet of 2 degrees. Some say 4 or 5 degrees, but that's an average. For the northern regions, for places like this, it will be more like a rise of 7, 8, even 9 degrees Celsius. With that kind of increase, these glaciers don't stand a chance. This landscape has been part of Inuit culture forever. It has always been part of their house, their territory. And it's changing at an incredible rate of speed. The Lord of the Arctic is suffering from the absence of sea ice. He now has to find other sources of food on land, which dangerously limits this ice hunting specialist's ability to feed. There's estimated to be about 25,000 polar bears in the world. Uh, Canada has about two thirds of the, of the, of the known polar bears. Um, there are certain areas um, where polar bears are not doing well, and those are typically areas where there's less sea ice. 
the dependency of the pole bear on the ring seal, but you take away the, the sea ice, and what you're doing is you're depriving the ring seal of a place to have its pups. So if you take that food source away, the domino effect of that is that everything that's dependent on the seal is going to suffer, particularly in the areas like the Hudson Strait, between Northern Quebec and Baffin Island. Um, there's issues where there's less ice, and various reports have uh, stated that the bears are in quite poor shape. Polar bears are excellent swimmers and can travel long distances, but that doesn't make them good sea hunters. It's almost autumn and he is hungry. He must find food soon or he won't survive. He's prepared to take enormous risks to ease his hunger. Walrus are an excellent food source, but attacking one of the most powerful predators in the Arctic is an enormous challenge. to be careful. Walrus tusks can prove fatal. In the confusion caused by the surprise attack, a young walrus is left alone. Its mother tries to climb back to help her pup, but the bear won't give up his prize easily. With all his strength, he tips over the female, who weighs more than 1,000 kilos. This rare attack on such a large predator was a risky move, but for our bear, it was well worth it. Others won't be so lucky. On the edge of a cliff, a colony of myrrhs nests as they have for centuries. To feed their young, the parents return with odd little fish. In the past, they mostly fed their nestlings Arctic cod, but the warmer seas in some areas have allowed fish from the south to invade, like capelin and sandlands. The edge of the Arctic is creeping northward, endangering wildlife that specialize in ice. This starving polar bear waits at the foot of a cliff, hoping to feed on the meager carcass of a fallen bird. But no such luck. Like many others, he takes to the sea in search of whatever food he can find. On the southern edge of the Arctic, the devastating effects of climate change are clear to see. This polar bear couldn't find the food he needed to survive. is here at last, and the polar bears will soon be able to get onto the new ice shelf. But the ice is late in forming. Late autumns delay the vital formation of sea ice, which lets the polar bears travel to new hunting grounds. The town of Churchill in northern Manitoba is on the polar bear migration route north. It's a transitional route between land and the ice shelf. The bears have to wait for the ice again this year, which means a lot of bears congregate in one relatively small area.
confrontation is inevitable. Hunger drives some of them to the shore in search of seaweed, anything to fill an empty stomach. But the largest carnivore in the Arctic can't manage on so little food. There's not much food on land. These bears normally keep well away from humans, yet some venture ever closer to the town. Over the years, residents of Churchill have learned to live with polar bears close to their homes. Hunger drives these predators to overcome their natural fear of humans. Bears that venture into town are caught and temporarily housed in a specially designed jail. Once the sea ice forms, they're released into the wild. The smell of garbage attracted this bear, but all he can find is an empty can. The first signs of ice appear, but it'll be a while before the bears can leave solid ground. To me, it puts forward the argument that the environment should be at the top of the list and everything else comes under it. And I think that speaks to the, our lack of relationship with the natural world. Down south, where we, we're becoming more of an urban culture, in order to, to protect our home, which is our planet, you have to go out and you have to understand how nature works. And again, it's the idea, which is the wrong approach, is, well, it's us and nature. That's totally the wrong approach. We're nature. The first signs of a developing ice shelf can barely support the weight of this impatient fellow. But he ventures out, desperate to find solid ice that will allow him to hunt again. A glimmer of hope, a sheet of ice, fragile but stable, enough to bear his weight. But this frozen fragment is an illusion. Further out to sea, there's not enough ice to withstand the impatience of the Lord of the Arctic. Looking toward the horizon, the polar bear searches in vain for a path to survival. His future depends on the viability of a region that is changing and unstable. And if nothing is done to stabilize the expected rise in temperature in the Arctic, he may well become the sad icon of a planet in decline. <laughs> <laughs> 